turns out that magnesium plays a very significant role in how we utilize carbohydrates. And it plays a very powerful role when it comes down to insulin resistance. Magnesium could be one of the missing links that we really need when it comes down to just overall metabolic health. Let's open with an interesting study that was published in the journal Diabetes Care. It took a look at 500,000 people. Okay, now these 500,000 people, they found that there was less instance of diabetes in those that had a higher magnesium intake. Okay, now this isn't necessarily with supplementation, this is just if they consumed more magnesium in their diet. Now, I will say one of the biggest problems that we face is that when you look at most regions of the world, there is not adequate magnesium consumption. Okay, we are not getting enough magnesium through our diets, whether it's through food choices or mag depleted soil, whatever. We are not getting enough magnesium. So that's like first and foremost, if we have a deficiency, we need to kind of correct that. But let's get into the nuancey stuff. This is very fascinating. Now let's take a look at another study. This study was published in the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition. I love these kinds of studies because this one is what's called a meta-analysis. Took a look at 18 different studies. So it's looking at like an aggregate of data, okay? 18 different studies, 12 of which looked at diabetic patients. Six were at risk for diabetes. So I like this because it's not taking people that are all the way over into the diabetic realm, but people that might be like teetering on the edge, which is unfortunately a large percentage of the world. Uh, anyhow, let's take a look at this. So they found that the magnesium group, which was 336 participants, compared to the placebo group, which was 334 participants, had significantly reduced fasting glucose levels in the diabetic group. Okay, so this is great. This tells us that, okay, if diabetic patients were consuming magnesium in this particular study, their glucose was lower in a fasting state. What about the at-risk group? The at-risk group saw significant improvements uh, even two hours after having a glucose bolus. So if they give them 75 grams of glucose, they had a significant reduction in their glucose levels even two hours after having that. So arguably an even better response. That's really cool stuff. The other thing they found with the at-risk group was lower levels of what's called the homeostatic level of insulin resistance, the HOMA-HR. This is what you look at when you're looking at sort of a, a wide breadth of data to ultimately determine someone's level of insulin resistance over kind of as a lagging indicator. They saw improvements in that. So ultimately, based on this study, it demonstrated that having magnesium in the diet may be responsible for modulating insulin resistance. Pretty powerful stuff. So with that being said, what are the mechanisms here? Like, what do we need to look at? Like, what's happening inside the body? I'm a biochem guy, I wanna know that. The hard part is with mechanistic stuff, we don't always know the concrete answers but I can look at three different ways here that magnesium is playing a role with our carbohydrate utilization. The first one is the relationship between magnesium and insulin. Okay, remember this, insulin cells, like beta, pancreatic beta cells, the cells that produce insulin, are very excitable. Okay, they're, they're high strung. So they are heavily influenced by like membrane changes and kind of like these overall uh, membrane potential changes. They're influenced by that. So when they have a big change in the gradient of electrolytes, things like that, they're very powerfully influenced. So what happens is when we consume carbohydrates, glucose enters the pancreatic beta cell, okay? And through processes, it turns into what's called glucose 6-phosphate, which through, again, more processes turns into ATP. When it does that, it triggers what's called a depolarization of the membrane. This depolarization changes the gradient and changes like what minerals and things like that are allowed in. Again, I'm oversimplifying this, but essentially when this depolarization occurs, you have a big influx of calcium that comes in. Now, calcium is excitatory. That means when calcium comes in, it stimulates the pancreatic beta cell to produce insulin. It's like, this is like a jolt of electricity. In order to counterbalance that, and to order to have this whole process work, we need magnesium as well because magnesium is also required for ATP. So when mag ATP, magnesium bound ATP and ATP decrease, it essentially is messing up sort of the chemical coupling that occurs. Long story short, it's disrupting the signal, kind of the glucose signal that's telling the pancreatic beta cell to release insulin. In other words, I don't wanna say it's a rate limiting step, but it's very, very much so required. Without magnesium, we're gonna have probably too much calcium 
slamming in, stimulating a constant release of insulin or a more advanced, more exaggerated release of insulin for too long of a period of time. Again, that's mechanistic data that we don't 100% know is the case, but when we look at the research and we see what we do know, this is kind of what we can somewhat conclude. Now, there's an interesting role when it comes down to magnesium and peripheral insulin sensitivity though. So this means how magnesium plays a role in the cells in our body, like in our muscle tissue and everything like that, absorbing glucose. So this is really fascinating stuff. Now, one of the things that I wanna recommend when it comes down to magnesium, when it comes down to carb utilization, insulin sensitivity, things like that, is choosing the right kinds of foods anyway. So I put a link down below for 25% off of Thrive Market. So they are a grocery store that's online. So using that link, you save 25% off your initial entire grocery order with them. But the reason that I mention them is because all the things we're talking about have to do with carbohydrates and our body being able to become potentially more metabolically flexible, the ability to use carbohydrates, but also the ability to use fats and not kind of overdo the carbs here. So they have just a wide breadth of different kinds of foods. So you don't have to be keto, you don't have to be vegan or anything like that. They just have done the legwork when it comes down to finding really good foods. So I cannot recommend them enough. I've been using them for about four years. They are awesome. They have my Thomas Lauer stamp of approval on just about all the foods that they bring into their shelves. And the cool thing is you save 25% off using that link. So then everything just gets delivered to your doorstep. So you do your shopping based on what kind of diet you're doing, based on you know different sugar-free or you can go gluten-free. You just check boxes and the food's populated. It's really cool. And then it gets delivered to your doorstep. So that link is down below to save you 25% off. Plus you get a free gift when you use that link down below. So check Thrive Market out after this video. Okay, so magnesium and peripheral insulin sensitivity is really interesting because what will happen is when we consume carbohydrates, uh, we produce insulin as we talked about previously this insulin then binds to an insulin receptor on the cell when it binds to an insulin receptor on the cell it triggers this stuff called tyrosine kinase okay and when tyrosine kinase is phosphorylated in other words activated uh, it's triggering another cascade of things this phosphorylation is long story short allowing the glucose to ultimately end up in the cell okay so if insulin hits the insulin receptor on a cell that triggers a messenger, sort of this uh, tyrosine kinase phosphorylation that allows a GLUT4 translocation to occur, meaning the glucose transporter comes to the outside of the cell and then grabs the glucose. So insulin is required for this to occur. It's called insulin dependent GLUT4 translocation. Complicated gobbledygook. In other words, magnesium is a rate limiting step in that process. So we cannot get the catch mitt that catches the glucose out of the bloodstream to the right place unless magnesium is there. Not saying that adding more magnesium is going to help that situation, but if you're magnesium deficient, that could be one of the reasons why we see a higher prevalence of insulin resistance in that case. Now let's talk about the gene expression side. This is where it gets really, really wackadoodle, but super cool. Okay, so there was a study that was published in the journal Magnesium Research that took a look at patients that had gestational diabetes. Okay, this is cool because for six weeks, they had them go on 250 milligrams of a simple magnesium oxide, which isn't even in the best kind of magnesium. It's like kind of subpar, but still played a role versus a placebo. So what they found with this was not only did the magnesium group see a 9.7 milligrams per deciliter drop in their fasting glucose compared to 0.1 in the placebo group, but they saw changes in their gene expression. Okay, so they saw an increase in the expression of what's called PPAR, which is the gene that is responsible for mitochondrial biogenesis and ultimately, a lot, well I shouldn't say that, but it's the gene that's responsible more so for mitochondria being able to utilize fats better. It's sort of the fat adaptation gene, okay? So when our cells become more able to use fats, our mitochondria uses fats, that's good all around. It's good for fat burning, it's good for fat utilization in general. Basically, it's allowing the cell to become better at using fats and ultimately carbs, because it gets us kind of a little bit of both. But they also saw an increase in the expression of GLUT1. GLUT1 is a glucose transporter. So more glucose transporters means more buses able to take the glucose to the right place rather than floating around in our bloodstream. Additionally, they saw a decrease in oxidized LDL receptor expression, meaning we had less receptors 
for the oxidized LDL that we don't want that can trigger more inflammation and attribute to arterial plaque. So very interesting stuff overall when we look at how magnesium plays a role with carbohydrates. So what are the takeaways with this? If you're not getting enough magnesium, get magnesium. Magnesium is one of those things where if you overdo it, you're gonna know because you're going to be running to the bathroom. So I don't wanna say that it's hard to overdo it because that implies you should just go and take as much as you possibly can. And that's definitely not the case but it's really hard to determine when you're deficient or not. And you might have to kind of rebuild out of that deficiency a little bit. So magnesium supplementation might be an important thing to do. But again, if you can get it from food, all the better, right? It's just hard because we have a lot of magnesium deficient soil and we don't have the magnesium that we need from normal foods. If you're kind of on the fence with taking a magnesium supplement, I would recommend usually a chelated form. So like um, some kind of dimagnesium malate. Magnesium oxide is usually not the best kind of one. I usually like uh, magnesium glycinate, magnesium threonate, or magnesium malate. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you tomorrow.